He chose Heidelberg, where he arrived in 1816. Hegel is the most prestigious philosopher to have held a post at this university during its long history, and on the hillside across the river from the city is a path known as the Philosopher's Walk. To reach this path you climb through vineyards. Below is the old bridge across the Neckar, and on the far bank lies the centuries-old university city laid out beneath its castle. Years ago someone told me that the Philosopher's Walk was named after Hegel, but since then I've been told this isn't true, as Hegel apparently detested going for walks in the country. A year after arriving in Heidelberg, Hegel published The Encyclopedia of the Philosophical Sciences in Outline, for students to read before attending his lectures. This contains an outline of his entire philosophy, and lets the reader in on the code of his jargon as well as his eccentric use of various words. Logic wasn't the only concept to suffer. By now his lectures were completely incomprehensible unless you were up on the gobbledygook. Even the simplest explanations needed decoding. If we review in brief the moments of this transition of quality into quantity, the qualitative has for fundamental determination being and immediacy, where limit and determinatedness are identical with the being of the something in such a manner that, these being altered, the something itself vanishes. Not for nothing were several of those who broke the fiendishly difficult German Enigma code during World War II former Hegel students. In the Encyclopedia of the Philosophical Sciences in Outline, Hegel also elaborates his system. This can be viewed as a series of pyramidal structures culminating in a supertriad whose thesis is the absolute idea, which generates its antithesis, nature, and whose synthesis is spirit, or absolute reality. The entire system can be viewed as spirit, which is also absolute reality, contemplating itself and its own significance. As individuals we gradually move up through this system as we become more rational, more mind, more conscious of ourselves and our significance. This system is a vast spiritual monism, the all-embracing synthesis of the absolute idea and nature, spirit or absolute reality. But besides being triadic, it can also be viewed as cyclical, for differentiation is a necessary part of this whole. The dialectical method operates throughout, thesis generating antithesis, and so on. Truth can only be known after it has differentiated itself, generated its antithesis, error, and overcome this. Likewise God is only infinite because he has taken on the limitation of the finite and overcome this. A similar dialectical process is echoed in the fall of man, which was necessary so that he could achieve goodness. As well as the integration of synthesis, there is always the differentiation of thesis generating antithesis. In 1818, Hegel decided to embrace the antithesis of his decision to accept the post at Heidelberg. He now accepted the offer of a post at Berlin. Here he became professor of philosophy, the position that had become vacant on the death of Fichte. By now Napoleon had been defeated and Prussia was once again the dominant German state. It was embarking upon its most stiflingly conservative era, and Berlin was its capital. Hegel was to remain in Berlin for the next thirteen years. His lectures became an institution, attracting hundreds of students, and the miasma of his philosophical influence began to spread throughout German universities in the form of Hegelianism. Virtually all freedom of thought and political expression were forbidden in Prussia at the time. This meant that the intellectual energies of the students and sophisticated citizens of Berlin had to seek release elsewhere. The result was a great boom in the arts, philosophy, and music among the chattering classes. Hegel became practically the official philosopher of the Prussian state. In 1821 he published The Philosophy of Right, which deals with politics and rights in society. Hegel was by now all in favour of the status quo, and abhorred any thought of radical social change. The basic dialectic of his new work was Thesis, Abstract Universal Laws, Antithesis, Personal Conscience, Synthesis, The Ethics of a Society. Hegel believed that this society should rest on the values of the family and the established professions. Yet, surprisingly, the state he envisaged is closer to the British model of the period than the Prussian. 
It included parliamentary government, a monarchy with limited powers, trial by jury, and toleration of dissent, especially of religious dissenters and Jews. As far as I can discover, Hegel was entirely free of anti-Semitism, which was considered quite socially acceptable, and reached epidemic proportions in Prussian society during this period. Meanwhile, Hegel continued doing what he knew best, bamboozling lecture halls filled with scores of earnest students. With his snuff-box laid out beside him on the lectern, and his large, lank-haired head bowed, he would shuffle awkwardly through his folios of notes, turning the pages forward and back as he hesitantly delivered sausage-like strings of abstruse qualifying clauses, his words frequently interrupted by bouts of coughing, until at last, rising to a plateau of pure abstraction, he would occasionally achieve an apotheosis of unexpected eloquence, which momentarily lifted his speech above the constantly conflicting theses and antitheses of jargon, to a sublime pinnacle transcending all meaning, where it would expand, as if of its own accord, before bursting into yet another fit of coughing. Sometimes a particularly bamboozled student would afterward follow him to his rooms, here he would find an odd, pasty-faced figure, seated at a huge desk in a yellow-gray dressing-gown which reached to the floor, fumbling through scattered piles of discarded papers and books. In the midst of his awkward discourse with his visitor, the philosopher would often drift off, mumbling and fumbling, for minutes on end, to all intents and purposes entirely oblivious of the other's presence. Hegel published little during this period— but a number of dedicated cryptographers took notes at his lectures, and these have been published among his collected works. These published notes contain Hegel's most detailed exposition of his ideas on aesthetics, the philosophy of religion, and his notorious philosophy of history. This attempts to reduce history to a dialectic process, a pseudo-idea which was the return with a vengeance in the works of his follower, Marx. According to this approach, history has a purpose— God's will for Hegel, the achievement of a communist utopia for Marx. Hegel traces the crab-like dialectic advance of history across the sand castles of time. The empires of China, ancient Greece, and Rome finally give way to the glories of the Prussian state, the highest form of community life ever known on earth, far transcending the rights of any mere individual. History shows us that when all but the name of philosophy was lost in other lands, it maintained itself as the peculiar possession of the German nation. We have received from nature the high calling to be guardians of this sacred fire, as in earliest times the world spirit maintained the highest consciousness in the Jewish nation. It wasn't Hegel's idea that the earlier guardians of the sacred fire of highest consciousness should suffer the fate they did at the hands of the Nazis in the twentieth century. Hegel would have been appalled by Hitler and the abominations of the Third Reich. But writing such garbage didn't help matters, to say the least. Hegel saw history from the widest possible perspective, a world-historical view. History was viewed as a process of self-realization. Humanity was embarked upon a journey of intellectual reflection and self-understanding, a growing awareness of its own unity and purpose. We take possession of our entire past when we see the story of our self-realization as a meaningful whole, Hegel declared. So the aim of history was the discovery of the meaning of life, no less. Progress, understanding the past, as if it had only one interpretation, the meaning of life, far from being a world-historical view. Such ideas are very much rooted to their time and place, early 19th century Germany. The German states were uniting to become a powerful European nation. The Industrial Revolution was spreading throughout Europe. The world was entering a golden era of scientific discovery, and the European empires were spreading to the farthest outposts of the globe. It all looks very different from a late 20th century perspective. Progress is no longer regarded as inevitable, and humanity has even come to terms with the possibility of its own extinction. Likewise, it is science that has taken on the lineaments of the absolute, rather than spirit. The Hegelian theory of history couldn't cope with such developments any more than the system to which it gave birth. The Marxist theory of history was able to cope with the inevitable collapse of the capitalist system that obstinately refused to happen. We no longer view history as a meaningful and predetermined pattern but more as a scientific experiment whose outcome now lies largely in our hands. 
Yet for all its faults, Hegel's view of history did not entirely cloud his judgment. Almost alone among nineteenth-century thinkers, he recognized the coming significance of America. In the era to come, this is where the burden of the world's history will reveal itself. Marx, Nietzsche, Jules Verne, all the great nineteenth-century prophets missed the most significant development of the twentieth century. In 1830, Hegel was appointed rector. Line. Hegel also elaborates his system. This can be viewed as a series of pyramidal structures, culminating in a super triad whose thesis is the absolute idea, which generates its antithesis, nature, and whose synthesis is spirit or absolute reality. The entire system can be viewed as spirit, which is also he chose Heidelberg, where he arrived in 1816. Hegel is the most prestigious philosopher to have held a post at this university during its long history, and on the hillside across the river from the city is a path known as the Philosopher's Walk. To reach this path, you climb through vineyards. Below is the old bridge across the Neckar, and on the far bank lies the centuries-old university city laid out beneath its castle. Years ago, someone told me that the Philosopher's Walk was named after Hegel, but since then I've been told this isn't true. As Hegel apparently detested going for walks in the country. A year after arriving in Heidelberg, Hegel published the Encyclopedia of the Philosophical Sciences in outline for students to read before attending his lectures. This contains an fundamental determination, being, and immediacy, where limit and determinateness are identical with the being of the something in such a manner that these being altered, the something itself vanishes. Not for nothing were several of those who broke the fiendishly difficult German Enigma code during World War II former Hegel students. In the Encyclopedia of the Philosophical Sciences, an out outline of his entire philosophy, and lets the reader in on the code of his jargon as well as his eccentric use of various words. Logic wasn't the only concept to suffer. By now, his lectures were completely incomprehensible unless you were up on the gobbledygook. Even the simplest explanations needed decoding. If we review in brief the moments of this transition of quality into quantity, the qualitative has for.